Thanks very much, uh, Mark. Yeah, one person can't replace Sharon, so there's two of us uh, doing it. Do I need this on, or can I just leave it there? Yeah. Leave it there. Great, thanks. So yeah, this um, talk is really picking up the health inequalities issue, which um, has been a constant three theme today. And we only heard this morning um, about Sharon, so um, just bear with us as we go through this talk, please. So Sharon wanted to talk about inclusion health uh, and what we mean by inclusion health groups. Uh, identify what we know on how we can better support people in these groups and how, highlight how we can maximise existing opportunities. And I know um, she's a real... Um, uh, she really cares deeply about co-production, so she would have focused on that as well uh, through her talk, as Mark was talking about earlier. So uh, Sharon is based at University College London, where there's a, a collaborative centre for inclusion health, uh, which she talks about as a social justice movement. But I really wanted to focus on this second quote here, which is from the NHS, which talks about socially excluded people, are people who typically experience multiple overlapping risk factors for poor health, such as poverty, violence, and complex uh, trauma. And so, um, who, who are we talking about with these inclusion health groups? So again, picking up on quite a few of the comments that have been made, uh, people who are homeless, um, who are dependent on other substances, vulnerable migrants, gypsy, roma, and traveller communities, sex workers, people in contact with the justice system, and victims of modern slavery. Now, researchers like me put people in groups, but of course they're not in groups. There's a lot of overlap between these groups. And in particular, there's a lot of overlap with people with mental health conditions. So they re really are important to factor in these groups uh, when we're thinking about uh, reducing smoking in people with mental health conditions. And people in these groups would really benefit from getting healthcare interventions, um, but unfortunately there's a reliance on emergency healthcare and there's an underuse of primary and preventive care services. So I'm not going to read out that um, top quote, which I think is pretty self-evident, uh, but people who are, who are in these groups, life can be extremely hard, but also extremely short, uh, and across socially excluded groups, um, you see a huge difference and disparity in uh, life expectancy. And uh, actually, across socially excluded groups, unusually, it is women who have uh, a shorter life expectancy uh, than males. But both groups, as you can see, a very uh, striking difference there. And a lot of that is probably due to their smoking. Um, so um, we know that a third of deaths are due to causes which are amenable to timely and effective health care, such as uh, smoking cessation. And I think um, uh, Peter then just uh, referred to the high smoking rates in these groups. And you can see here, I'm not going to go through them, these mind-boggling smoking prevalence rates uh, for some of these uh, groups. Some of there is no data on, so we don't actually know what the smoking prevalence uh, rates are, but we do know that they're very, very high. So they should really be a huge focus uh, for our interventions. Now, we know that uh, smoking causes harm and is dangerous to everyone, but for people with multiple health and social needs, there's some extra risks and factors to consider, um, such as risky smoking practices where people are taking much harder and longer drags, smoking unfiltered cigarettes, um, sharing cigarettes uh, and in groups. And then what people in these groups refer to themselves as very demoralising behaviours, such as having to pick, her, pick up cigarette butts uh, and smoke them, or asking strangers uh, for cigarettes. And then there's also the risk of exploitation, um, begging for cigarettes, exchanging sex for cigarettes, theft. Etc. And overall, this common theme we've heard about uh, today in terms of groups having uh, much less uh, money. So exacerbated risk and harm for these groups. And this is a diagram that I know Sharon has uh, made and is always looking for, for feedback on. But essentially, it's showing this sort of inverted timetable. So the more disadvantaged and social, uh, in social and health position you are at the sort of bottom of this triangle, the higher are the needs 
that the lower people's ability to change is perceived by people working with them. And hence, the lower their need for cessation is seen as a priority, mm. and then narrower, the narrower their opportunities to change become. Whereas those at the top who are in more advantaged social and health positions of this triangle, not the top in any other um, meaning, um, of course, have much greater opportunities to change. And it should really be the other way around. And, you know, it's incumbent on all of us to think how we can uh, invert this. So um, Public Health England, as, as Peter was saying, have produced an awful lot of uh, very good resources. And they've got produced this guidance on inclusion health. Uh, which you may not have read and encourage you to do so if you haven't. But it's really about embedding uh, smoking cessation uh, and other health promotion interventions in everyday practice um, and providing as much support for as long as is needed. And it's probably more likely to be needed for much longer with these groups than it might be um, for people uh, without some of these, uh, in, not in some of these settings. And I'm just going to give you one example here, which is about um, people using illicit opioids. Um, we know that COPD, chron uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, is much higher among patients with a known history of using illicit opioids, which is probably down or mostly down to their uh, smoking. Um, and so this study that Sharon was involved in is a cohort study uh, where there was uh, a matching of people using illicit opioids who had COPD, and then those and a, a similar group of C, people with COPD who weren't using opioids. And those um, in the opioid group had much higher rates of smoking-related ill health in life, so exacerbations of their chronic obstructive lung disease. And you might say, okay, well, what, what, what is it in relation to their smoking cessation treatment? Because this isn't a group very likely to use healthcare treatment. But in fact, they found in their study and um, that there wasn't any difference in accessing other relevant health interventions, but only 3% um, were offered smoking cessation treatments. So I think a really big disparity there, and perhaps something rather specific to the smoking cessation field that needs a bit more attention, uh, they weren't just not getting offered smoking cessation support. So... Um, I won't go into this slide in, in great detail, but I think um, a lot of people think that these groups are hard to engage, but it's really about giving the right support at the right place by the right person. And I think these are common themes we've heard about already today, particularly we heard about place. Um, and it's about a person-centred approach, and, and that's really re very relevant to anybody uh, with any mental health conditions, and particularly relevant for some of these groups. So I'm now going to hand over to Debbie uh, to do the second part of this. Thank you. So some examples of um, getting support at the right time, uh, in the right place, um, to the right people. So Sharon included uh, some work we'd done in South London of evaluating uh, at an uh, integrated tobacco dependent treatment clinic and a drug and alcohol service in South London. Uh, and what we did, we, we, we gave people the choice of uh, different types of e-cigarettes and, and, and the way we decided on um, which e-cigarettes uh, to, to, to use in the service is we, we got a small group of clients together who use the service and we give them different types of cigarettes to take away for a week and then try them out, um, have a conversation with people, then come back and then they chose the, the, the devices that they wanted um, to use. Um, so the, the choice of devices, so alongside behavioural support for 12 weeks was a um, disposable type e-cigarette, so that's the e-burn cigarette that some people have, have mentioned today, um, the, uh, a refillable rechargeable device um, and uh, a pod style device and people had uh, a range of nicotine strength and a range of flavours. They also could choose nicotine replacement therapy alongside that um, as well and in terms of uh, what products that they selected, it, the majority of people uh, chose the refillable device, um, followed by the pod type of device, and then fewer people chose the disposable device. But the majority of people also chose to use nicotine replacement therapy alongside their el electronic cigarettes, and then stopped using NRT about two weeks um, after. 
And we, we tested the, the integrated stop smoking service with 124 people who were accessing drug and alcohol services. Um, and by the end of their, their last appointment, we saw a significant reduction in cigarettes smoked per day uh, and also a reduction in carbon monoxide levels. And then in terms of quit rates, um, we saw that um, over time, by the time someone got to, to, to session eight, um, half of people were, were stopping smoking. And so this kind of underscores that, um, and what we did was it wasn't a 12-week intervention, it was a 12-session intervention. So a lot of people um, kind of dropped out and then came back and then dropped out and came back and disappeared and, and came back. Um, and that's quite difficult to evaluate in, in a research setting when, when, when things um, uh, uh, and, and research measures are, are standardised. But in terms of um, moving on from drug and alcohol services to, to people who use homeless uh, services, um, Sharon and, and Lynn Dawkins and um, people at King's College London and Queen Mary's U University, in collaboration with some homeless charities, conducted a feasibility study where we um, randomised people to either get a free e-cigarette starter kit and four weeks' worth of e-liquid, so people would be given uh, a week's worth of e-liquid e um, at each of the, the four sessions. And then we give people some uh, leaflets around tips and tri tricks to, to swap from smoking to vaping. And it was the refillable, rechargeable device that we used in this trial. And then people randomised to usual care were given a leaflet how to access local stop smoking services. We recruited 100... Um, we were aiming to recruit uh, 153 participants and managed to recruit, recruit half of those people, but managed to keep people in this study for up to six months. Um, the intervention was well received and staff uh, were, were able and willing um, to integrate the intervention into, into homeless services. And we had a few people who were randomised to the e-cigarette arm that, that managed to quit. But demonstrating that you could do this in homeless services then led on to um, a, a larger randomised control trial. And what we also saw the, the, um, with the outcomes in the, in the feasibility study is people were engaging in less risky behaviours such as asking uh, strangers uh, for a cigarette. And in terms of um, the work that's ongoing at the moment, so we use the data from the feasibility trial to do a large pragmatic cluster randomised control trial. And we've just finished recruitment uh, in 32 uh, centres in England, Scotland uh, and Wales and just collecting follow-up data at the moment. Um, Sharon and I uh, are also uh, at the moment developing a... Uh, tobacco Harm Reduction Toolkit, which is co-designed by people who use uh, homeless services. So we're just finishing off some um, interviews at the moment. And then just to plug for um, a great resource uh, by the NCSCT uh, around um, delivering very brief advice to uh, homeless services. And I know Louise Ross is uh, still in the room. Uh, Louise interviewed a lot of uh, people who... Um, attend uh, a, a local uh, homeless service in, in Leicester and there's some, some great stories and, uh, and films uh, of those people. So just to sum up, smoking is dangerous to everybody uh, and it exacerbates health uh, inequalities. And taking an evidence-based approach to integrating a broader tobacco harm reduction agenda uh, shows signs of promise. Thank you very much.